And my name is Matt Party, one of the pastors here. So glad you guys could be here with us to dive into God's Word and worship with us today. As you can see from the video, we are in the book of Ruth. We're on chapter 2. Brian Wiles kicked us off last week uh, with chapter 1 and excited to continue on with this awesome story of this uh, faithful woman and this faithful man and uh, how God is using them to uh, weave his bigger story. So before I jump into that, I was just thinking about these Uh, season that we're in, this time of the year. And I don't know for you, when you go back home for Thanksgiving or Christmas, do you ever play some games with your family? You know, you kind of want to turn off the football games and do some games. And sometimes in our family, we will play the classic charades game. You guys have played that before? Sometimes you guys in your life groups are kind of kicking off a little icebreaker and you'll play some charades, throw some different words, movies, different things in there and act those out. And you know, when you're playing charades, sometimes they're really simple, you know? If somebody just starts boxing and they start humming like Eye of the Tiger, you know, somebody's pretty quickly going to yell out Rocky, or you're just kind of moaning and raising your arms up like this, someone's going to know that's Frankenstein. But sometimes they're acting out things and you're like, this person's not very good and we don't know what you're talking about, you know? And it's difficult to uh, figure out the picture of what they're trying to communicate. But charades is this fun game where we're trying to give this picture or this image of something that we are trying to describe. I share that with you because in the Scripture, there's these awesome pictures, these awesome things being played out and acted out in the Old Testament, pointing not to a movie or a TV show or something like that, but pointing to Messiah, pointing to the actual Christ figure and his incarnation. So as we get into this different kinds of Christology of the Old Testament, there's these beautiful images and pictures in the Old Testament that were there for the Jewish people to experience and to read about later on or to pass on these stories so that when Jesus came, when Messiah came, they would know who he was like. These prophecies and these pictures and these images to describe Jesus. And we're going to see that today in Ruth chapter 2. Now before again I jump into it, I just wanted to give you some more big picture like Pastor Wiles did last week of this book. First off, let me just show you where we are in the Old Testament. First we've got the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's called the Pentateuch. That's the, they also called it the Book of the Law. In these first five books of the Old Testament were the creation story, Moses and the Exodus, and then a lot of the laws and God establishing a relationship with his people who knew nothing about Jehovah or who God was. And he's describing to them, this is how you should live. This is what this is like to walk with me. Then right after the Pentateuch, we have Joshua who's following up with Exodus of Moses. After Moses dies, the baton is handed to Joshua, and Joshua leads the people out of Egypt, over the Jordan, and uh, into the promised land. Then we have the difficult time of Judges, where the judges were leading the people. And at the very end of Judges, as Brian Wiles shared last week, it says a very disturbing verse. And it's leading right into the book of Ruth. And it says, and all the people did as they saw fit. It was a time of unrighteousness. It was a time of chaos. So as we come upon this book of Ruth, that's kind of the backdrop of what's happening. God was trying to establish his relationship with his people and bring them to this beautiful place. But they're already going their own way. And here comes Ruth. And we just saw in this video kind of the key verse of this whole book, Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, which just showed up in the vid- video, because Naomi is now in um, uh, Moabite. She's, in, she's with these Moabite people in Moab. And she's saying, you stay here with your family, Ruth. You're a Moabite. We're in Moab. You go back to your family, and I'm going to go back to Bethlehem. And Ruth shows this incredible loyalty. And she says, don't urge me, Naomi, to leave you and turn back from you. Where you will go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and my God, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. So as we jump into chapter two, we're remembering chapter one is this incredible 
expression of loyalty. There's been weddings and funerals. There's been weeping. And there's also this famine that they're starting the whole story. And now this famine has turned into harvest. There's a harvest back in Bethlehem. They have traveled back and they're getting ready to meet Boaz. And this is where we're picking up the story in chapter 2. Let me kick this off and read the first few sections and I'm going to break this chapter into three parts. Here we go. Ruth chapter 2 verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech. Elimelech is Naomi's husband that has passed away. And that's why they had to move back. And Elimelech's relative, his name was Boaz. And Ruth and the Moabites said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, she didn't know that at the time, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseers of the harvesters, who does this young woman belong to? Who is this woman, this foreign woman that's working here on these grounds? The overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. That's her mother-in-law. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now. She's been working a long time, except for a short rest in the shelter. So what is happening in this scene is they're back. These two widows, not just Naomi is a widow, but the Moabite woman, Ruth, who this book is named after, she had married one of these Israelites, Naomi's son, and he had died. And here are these two women in a vulnerable position back in this new land as widows. I'm sure they were broke. I'm sure they were scared. I'm sure this is a very difficult season for them. And Ruth says, well, we have to find mercy somewhere. We have to eat, right? We need sustenance. If you've ever had any kind of financial difficulties or financial trials and you know what kind of stress they can cause in your life, imagine these two women in probably a way worse situation. And Ruth says, let me just go out and I'll find a field. Now, a little bit of context to this. In the book of the law, in the Pentateuch, which I was just mentioning a little bit ago, one of the laws that they had to do, if they were generous and godly people, the farmers would often not perfectly clean out their fields. They would intentionally leave a little bit of the harvest behind as a way of charity, as a way of giving to the poor. So after the harvesters would go through during the harvest, there would often be needy people behind them gleaning off the field. That's what that word was all about. And, and Ruth says, man, maybe I can just go. Maybe I can pick up some scraps so that we don't starve in this situation. Ruth was a go-getter and she was faithful, which brings us to our first point. Ruth is not only loyal, so loyal to Naomi in a beautiful way, but is faithful and hardworking. She goes and she just puts her hand to it and works hard all day. Her pursuit of the grain points us to our need and our hunger for Jesus, the bread of life. Here is one of the pictures that we pull from this. Here is Ruth in this needy situation. So she goes out asking for mercy, looking for something to keep her alive. I'm sure they had a hunger in their belly, hoping they were going to be able to get some grain to go home and make some bread. And Jesus throughout the scripture, and especially in John chapter 6, refers to himself as the bread of life, the sustenance. Now, how important is grain and bread still in our culture today? You know, think about all the different cultures and all the things that we make, the breads and the, and the pitas and the tortillas and the pasta and all these things. And before you say, well, I'm on an Atkins diet, okay, I don't eat bread, all right? Don't, don't say that yet. Um, you know, I, don't, I try to avoid breads and grain and, and pasta. If you're saying that right now, just remember what this meant to them at that time. Water and fish and bread. 
kept them alive. One of the amazing miracles that Jesus did for the people to show that he was God, to show his power, was to multiply the bread and to feed the people. So we're reminded of this need for bread, this hunger that we have for sustenance, and how that points to our spiritual hunger, that spiritual need that we have that can only be satisfied in Jesus. In John chapter 6, verses 35 and 36, Jesus says this, Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. Jesus is using these physical things to point to this spiritual thing. He says, I'm the bread of life. If you take me into your life, not this physical hunger, you're not going to have that spiritual lostness. That spiritual hunger, that unsatisfiedness that's always just turning inside of you. He said, let me give you something that really satisfies my very self. He even says in here, whoever believes in me will never be thirsty again. Why we're named H2O, about the thirst and about the water in John chapter 4 when he's interacting with the Samaritan woman. He says, let me give you a living water. Jesus himself is more important in our lives and more satisfying than any other need that we have in life. And what is Jesus asking us to do? Be better people and be good? No, he says right in John 6, whoever believes in me will never in hunger and thirst again in this way. Jesus is inviting every one of us to believe in him, to ask him into our lives to begin this relationship with Him that leads to forgiveness through our faith in Him. So we go back to Ruth and we see this picture again of this hunger, this need, and this importance for someone to step up and satisfy that need and to help. So let's go on and read about Boaz, who's going to be this Christ picture for us. In Ruth chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we go on to the second part. So Boaz said to Ruth, they meet, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean from another field and don't go away from here. It's a safe place. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the man, men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. Wow, a man of peace, a man of mercy, a man of character. Now, remember again the backdrop of Ruth. What was the world doing at this time according to the Scriptures? Everyone was doing as they saw fit. It was a dangerous place. It was a violent place. It was not a place of righteousness. Most men were not like Boaz. So he really stands out in this backdrop of the world in this book. He's saying, you go to some other farm, you go to some other place, you might be in trouble. They might take advantage of you. They might not give you food and water. Even worse, they may hurt you. They may come after you. This is a good place for you. Stay here and be safe and be taken care of. What a huge relief to Ruth. Let's read on, starting in verse 10 through 12. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, what have I found? Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me? A foreigner. Boaz replied, I have been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother in your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, <clears throat> under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Wow. Can I draw your attention to that last verse one more time? Did he say, man, you are so blessed that you have come under my refuge. He says, may the Lord bless you. 
the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Wow. What an incredible testimony. What an incredible gospel example of Boaz talking to this pagan woman, talking to this Moabite who comes from a place of many gods. And that's why she said to Naomi, hey, whoever your God is, I want that to be my God now. She's showing great faith in the God of Israel. And she's traveled here. And Boaz says, I see this risk you take, this act of faith. What an amazing person you are. And I want you to know you're right in the right place. Not just because this is my land and my field. You are now under the wings of the God of Israel. How amazing. How beautiful. Here's the second point we draw. Boaz notices Ruth. He is kind to her. He encourages her with his words. He protects her. He blesses her. And he provides for her. This is a glimpse of of the character of God. I'm not sure as you sit here today what your view of God is. I know when I first became a Christian at a young age, I was not quite sure who this God was. I had many misconceptions, a lot of lies that would creep into my mind. And reading the Bible and understanding things like this of who the who God is and the character of God, reading things like the knowledge of the holy by A.W. Tozer, understanding the character of God revolutionized my life. And what the Scripture is teaching us here is whatever you think about God, He notices you. He sees you. He loves you. He is an encourager. He wants to encourage you. He wants to protect you. He wants to bless you. He wants to give you good things. And just as Boaz, I mean, she's like winning the lottery here with this situation. And she is so blessed. She says, what in the world have I done to deserve this kind of favor? She recognizes that she's not deserving of this favor. And how much so with you and I. We do not deserve this kind of love and favor from a holy God but He wants to give it to you. He loves you. He's protecting you. He's caring for you. He's kind to you. Do we respond with a worshipful heart? Do we respond in the way that she did and just like, wow, this is so amazing. I know in our culture, it's so easy to complain. It's so easy to be people of entitlement. And we just think of all the things we don't have. And we're just disappointed by so many things. And we hear things like this and we re remember the gospel. Remember that Jesus died on the cross and gave us something we don't deserve. And we just respond with faith. Say, man, I believe it. I want it in my life. And God says, you are now under the shelter of my wings by your faith. That's like winning the lottery spiritually. It's amazing. It's an incredible blessing. And we see Boaz blessing Ruth in this way. I'm going to skip through this next section and just summarize it, that she interacts a little bit more with Boaz and she's so thankful. And he has this uh, a communion of, uh, interaction with her, which I'll talk about in a moment. I'll, I'll revisit that. And, and pretty much they just have this warm interaction. And he gives her about, the Bible says, about 30 pounds of grain and sends her back to Naomi. So it's a good day. It's a great day for Ruth. And she is now returning home. She gets back and she's going to interact with Naomi. I'm imagining and I'm speculating here. In this time, Naomi sends this woman out and she has no idea what's in store for her this day. She's probably praying. She's probably stressed. She's probably nervous. If any of the mothers here have daughters and you're sending them out into a new situation, a new school, a new environment, new friends, whatever it might be, you're a little nervous and you're praying. And here comes Ruth with a big bag of grain. Here we go. Continuing on. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, 
she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. He's a, he's a good man. She added, the man is our close relative. He is the one, he is one of our guardian redeemers. This is a huge surprise to them. Then Ruth, the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers. Come back the next day until they finish harvesting all the grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and the wheat harvesters were finished and she lived with her mother-in-law. Now, I want to bring your attention to this term that Naomi doesn't know where she's working today. And Ruth comes back and says, I'm with Boaz. And she says, hey, this Boaz, this is incredible. This is God's sovereignty. This is God's providence because he is your guardian redeemer. He is our guardian redeemer. Another translation of the Bible says he is our kinsman redeemer. And Pastor Wiles mentioned this last week. Again, in the Leviticus code and in the, in, in the Pentateuch, there's this description of when these vulnerable people are, are in trouble and they're widowed, other people from the family would be responsible, would be obligated to take care of them and how it just seems to be happenstance, but it's not. It's God's will. Ruth shows up at the, at the perfect place. This next slide says the Hebrew word for this guardian redeemer or kinsman redeemer is a legal term that they used for one who has the obligation to redeem a relative in serious difficulty referenced in Leviticus 25. So here's our third point. Boaz is a kinsman redeemer for Ruth and is a picture of Jesus the eternal kinsman redeemer. This beautiful term means so much. Those that are in danger, those that are in trouble, those that have great need and that are extremely vulnerable, someone from the family needs to step up and take care of them. And Boaz is this person. But again, this is all just a picture of Christ. This is all just a foreshadowing, a glimpse of what Jesus was going to be to us. Again, remembering the gospel and why we're here and why we worship with such full hearts as you and I were in danger. You and I were in trouble in our own mistakes and in our own sins. And Jesus stepped up and said, I will cover for them. I will love them and I will forgive them. And as we respond in faith and we put our faith in Jesus, he now becomes our redeemer. That is put toward our account. And you know what's incredible about that? Not only is Jesus just our redeemer and our savior, he's the God of the universe. He has sacrificed himself for us. All these amazing things that were incredible in and of themselves. The Bible says that when you and I believe, we become brothers with Jesus. We become family. God says you are grafted now in to my family. It is an incredible thought to think of not being included in, in this family. And now by his mercy, we are. So as we see this picture, as Boaz protects her, loves her, forgives her, Ruth is in this great spot we see this interaction that we can have with God, I want to think about our response to this. Okay? Boaz really provides for her, right? In a lot of different ways. And we see how God is providing for us every single day. And you know, during this time of the year, it's a great time of the year. I love this time of the year. I love coming upon Thanksgiving. And for all of us to just be thinking about, okay, what am I so thankful for? Why should we be thankful? That is such an important holiday for us to come back to this place of reflection. I love the time of Christmas that we're upon. And it usually kind of brings something out of people's hearts of like, man, I need to be in this spiritual place where I'm really remembering those that are less fortunate and how I can respond to God with generosity, with love, with help. 
And you know, we're going to be doing a whole bunch of things during this season at H2O to just give you an opportunity for that. Some are small and some are really huge. Just a couple just to kind of highlight, you know, every year we do this Operation Christmas Child, which is a, a really great thing to celebrate where we, we get these shoe boxes and we fill them up with about $20 worth of stuff and Samaritan Ministries just sends them all over the world to needy, vulnerable children that wouldn't have any kind of Christmas uh, without that. We're going to be celebrating that. We're going to be doing that as an overflow of our heart to bless other people. We're also going to be helping some people uh, locally here. We have many internationals here in our community. Just like Ruth was this, you know, immigrated to a new place in this vulnerable place, we have a lot of internationals here at our school, and we work with Global Connections. Ryan Cozy is here in our church, and he's leading Global Connections. And every year they do this wonderful dinner for them. And so we're going to be providing a bunch of meals uh, H2O is going to be doing this, and a bunch of the other churches in Bowling Green are going to be doing this. And we encourage you to participate. We encourage you to lean into this and think about, man, how do I want to respond to God with the blessing that He gave me to bless other people? And whether it's small or in it's in big ways, we want you to worship in that way. So we'll be talking to you a little bit more about that to be helping uh, some internationals here have a great meal for Thanksgiving. Of course, we always talk about the nest. We're so excited about the nest. That's one of the ministries that we're connected to here in Bowling Green that helps women that have decided to keep their babies and they need some time and some help and resources to finish school or to continue to work. And the nest does all of that for these women and their children for free. So please be thinking of them. But there's even a bigger thing that I wanted to bring to your attention. When I was praying about this, I was talking to my wife about this. I thought, Lord, who are the real vulnerable people in our society today? Things are a lot different today than they were back in Ruth's time. So you kind of have to think, OK, God, what what are you doing in, in this time? And uh, my wife was bringing this up with me and I wanted to share it with you is I think of one of the most probably clearest and sincere ways that we can really help people in our community is with our children. You know, when you think of like, what's a needy charity? What's a needy thing to give my prayer and my money to and my time? I think of the children in our community. And we really have a pretty major crisis about 30 minutes from us right now. And it has to do with foster care. And it has to do with these really vulnerable children that are just right up here in Lucas County. Lucas County has been sharing this for the last couple years that they are in the worst situation they've ever been in with so many children. It just absolutely breaks your heart with the, the drug overdoses and all the things that are happening with parents. And literally thousands of children are not in a safe place that have to be pulled out of their homes and they need somebody to step up for them. They need someone to help them. I think of Mike and Sarah that are in our church that are doing foster care, and I'm just so thankful for them taking this risk and, and really leading in this, in this important way, kind of being a Boaz to our community right now in their foster care. I think of Tom and Lauren Stewart, who is one of our pastors and our leaders up at H2O Toledo, one of our dear friends. He graduated from here. He was a leader in our church. Lauren's a leader in our church, and they're married now, and they're fully immersed in foster care up in Toledo and have some just sweet little guys that they're taking care of. So as I just end this message, I'd like you to contemplate what God might be doing in your heart. You know, think about that and pray. If you can't do that personally, maybe there's some other ways that you can help. And for many of you college students, I'd like you to just kind of allow that seed to come into your heart. You know, Mary Lynn and I, before we were even married, had that seed planted in our heart for foster care and adoption. And so when we got engaged and we started talking about marriage, that was something we talked about even before we were married. And having to get to go through the blessing of adopting two children into our lives was huge. A great blessing. 
And I thank God that that was planted in us long ago. So even as you're sitting here, you're like, well, I'm not even married yet. I haven't begun my family. Maybe that's something that God wants you to think about for the future, to step up for those in our community that are vulnerable. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us. Lord, we are so grateful for what this chapter says about who you are. Lord, Boaz was not the hero of this story, nor was Ruth. Uh, Lord, you are the hero of this story. Crafting this all together through the normal trials and difficulties of life, of weddings and funerals and hunger and struggle. Lord, you were sovereignly leading these two people together to give this beautiful picture of how you meet our needs. Lord, as I just reflect on my life and I think about um, all that you have done, Lord, I, I pray that we would all be in this place right now, that we would come before you and say, wow, God, thank you. I am so undeserving of the incredible blessing from you, a holy God. Lord, you tell us in your word, you see us. You love us. You protect us. You provide for us. You show us your kindness. And as if that wasn't enough, you came to this earth and walked on this earth so that you might die for our sins to take care of our greatest need to cover our sins. And then, Lord, we don't just even walk away from that. You enter into a relationship with us. You ask us to come and sit at the table of your family. Wow. What a blessing. What a blessing to commune with the Holy God. I pray every person in this place, Lord, would respond to you in faith. Every person here would say, God, I see what you did. I know you see me, now I see you, and I want that in my life. Take a hold of my life all the more. And God, thank you, now we're on this adventure of this mission, and you said, I want you to be a person like Ruth now. I want you to be a person like Boaz, and I want you to bless other people. Lord, invite us into the mission. Challenge us. Speak to us. Move in our hearts, God, so that we might step up and bless other people with the resources that we have been given. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.